Oh boy, it's being recorded. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the art that has either made it by acquisitions or has actually been found in Athens era in Greece. Uh, the two major museums, as you can see on your screen, are the Acropolis Museum and the National Archaeological Museum. National Archaeological Museum, I gather they're doing some, some work and eventually they're going to have a little bit better building than what they have right now. It's kind of an old style museum, but it's a terrific museum. Collection is really what matters and their collection is non -parallel. Um So what I want to do today a little bit is talk to you a little bit about uh, most of the periods in Greek art, but particularly the archaic, the classical, and the Hellenistic. Now, the reason those three are interesting is because the archaic led to the classical Greek form. And I think there's an awful lot to be said for uh, what a lot of folks kind of refer to as the smiley face statues and, and paintings. Uh, they're quite good. And you can see progression through that period till you get to the classical, which is the stuff that everyone is familiar with. Now, the Hellenistic. It's almost as if uh, you're going from, uh, in Western European art, your high Renaissance into your uh, Baroque. And here, all of a sudden, emotion is the thing. And if some people find that the classic stuff sort of lacks emotion, the Hellenistic certainly has emotion. And that kind of gives lie to the old uh, expressions that Greek and Roman art are soulless. I don't believe that's true. So at any rate, let's let's go on. I mean, the first two things we're going to do are going to be uh, about uh, the different two different museums. So let's so let us take a look here if we can get this thing going forward. There we go. First one is the Acropolis Museum. Can everybody hear this? Yes, there are ruins right under the museum. There we go. Now, this one is the other museum today, and it's the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. It's a Rick Steves. It's a short video. The one must-see site outside the central tourist zone is the National Archaeological Museum. This extraordinary collection lets you follow the sweep of Greek art history from 7,000 BC to 300 AD. A trove of funerary art from the royal tombs of Mycenae shows treasures from a society that thrived around a thousand years before the days of Socrates and Plato. You'll see finely decorated weapons and sheaths, exquisite golden jewelry, and the delicate Bacchio gold cups, reminders of the sophistication of that 15th century BC civilization. This warrior base from the 12th century BC 
shows women gathered to wave goodbye to a group of warriors heading off to war, sporting fancy armor with duffel bags hanging from their spears. These Mycenaean soldiers with their yellow ribbon moms are a timeless off to war scene repeated every generation in the 3000 years since. Ancient Greeks celebrated the human body. To them, it was the embodiment of the order found in nature. All the parts were there in geometrical, if not biological perfection. No individual features, everything was idealized. In fact, these archaic statues were named simply Kouros, meaning boy, or Kora, meaning girl. Statues from this age around 600 BC all had the same standard features. Weight spread evenly on two feet, arms rigid at the side, stiff braided hair, almond-shaped eyes, high eyebrows, and the same quirky little grins. Archaic statues all looked like cousins. During the archaic period, all the parts were there, but if they decided to walk, they would walk like a monster, stiffly, with no understanding of the subtle interplay between hips and shoulders. But Greek art evolved with its society. The 80-year period from about 480 to 400 BC was known as the golden age of Greeks, the age of Socrates and Pericles, and Athens was the center. During this time, the golden mean was nothing in excess. In both life and art, everything was to be in balance. Golden age sculptors shifted weight more believably, placing their statues in a contrapposto pose. That means relaxed, with hips shifted realistically and weight resting on one foot. Statues looked more lifelike. Ancient Greek treasures include the Poseidon of Artemisia. This stunning bronze statue cast in 460 BC depicts the mighty god of the sea about to hurl his trident. Once again, we see that classic Greek balance between stillness and motion. But in around 330 BC, Athens was conquered by the Macedonians from the north. Subjugation by the Macedonians under Philip II and his son Alexander the Great ushered in what's known as the Hellenistic period. The word Hellenistic refers to Greek culture after its political conquest. Greek Hellenistic art, like Greek Hellenistic society in general, evolved beyond the aesthetics of the Golden Age. While less balanced and composed, it was a more individualistic age with more exuberant and emotional art. The horse and jockey of Artemisia, cast in the second century BC, is filled with this Hellenistic energy. The high spirit of detail is astonishing, right down to the horse's dramatic head and the concerned look on the young jockey's face. The evolution of Greek art from stiff to realistic to emotional would be echoed by Europe 2,000 years later, from stiff Gothic to realistic Renaissance to emotional Baroque. Okay, so now we'll begin. Uh, we're going to start and we're going to cover the really old stuff rather quickly. Neolithic basically means Stone Age. Okay, so what we're looking at uh, are pieces of art that were done somewhere between uh, oh, 7,000, 3,300 BC. So you add 2,000 years to each of them, we're looking 9,000 years ago, some of it potentially. Um, these are all the things produced before they found out how to work bronze, which obviously ended in the Bronze Age. Uh, very interesting in that the figures are somewhat stiff and, and they're not particularly a realistic portrayal of what it is you're looking at. Um, but it is somewhat impressionistic in that uh, you, you sense that they stress what was important to them. And that, I think it makes for interesting uh, art to look at. Uh, again, uh, a seated man, they call it the thinker. Well, I don't know. Uh, I think that, that that's a debatable proposition, but I, I think frankly, it's not a cell phone, but uh, that was a bad joke. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this is somewhat typical of the statues. Of course, they etched, it would have been painted. 
Again, here we see some where some of the pigment is still there. Uh, they're very interesting, but we're not going to dwell on it today. And then we get to the uh, polychrome stuff. And this is quite nice. Uh, obviously, quite a development from what was there before. And uh, somewhat recognizable. People are still doing things somewhat like that today. This one, if you take a look and camp the thing, and this is the legs. See where my cursor is? And that is the head. This is actually a person in a fetal position. And it would have been something that you would have hung around your neck and it would have dangled on your chest. Yeah. A necklace, so to speak. And then we get into the gold stuff that they did. Some of it was really stupendous. Some of it is just quite you know, awesome when you look at it. A lot of gold in Greece, apparently, uh, because there's an awful lot of gold uh, that shows up this period. Uh, and as we get into the next period, it's the Bronze Age. And again, as I told you, I'm moving quickly through this stuff. Uh, three major areas. And we did this last week, but I'll mention it again because it's important. The Mycenaean culture is the Greek mainland for the most part. Uh, it's Athens, Sparta, Argos, and the, and the like. Then you get the uh, Cyclades, which, uh, Cyclades rather, which is uh, Santorini and the islands up here. And then finally below you have the big island of Crete and this is the Minoan civilization. That's the old Minotaur country, so to speak. We talked last week how when you had the uh, volcano erupt in Santorini, not only did it affect Santorini and the islands around it, it affected Crete because the whole top of the island was swamped with what must have been a tremendous tidal wave. And Crete now declines. They somewhat decline, but once the mainlanders come in and repopulate, they get going again, but they get going in the Mycenaean culture for the most part thereafter. Okay. So what do we see in the Bronze Age? Well, this is an interesting slide to someone who is a specialist. To the rest of us, what it really means is that, you know, once you get the the earthquake, everything converges and you wind up really with this at the end, just the beginning. I, I included this slide just to show you uh, that we do actually have things that have been found from Troy, uh, the Trojan horse, the wars there. Uh, so Troy was actually in what today is Turkey, the uh, same way that uh, Ephesus, uh, Ephesus, the Roman city down here, is also in Turkey. Uh, obviously, they are not what they were then. Uh, they were Greek settlements for the most part. Even when it was Roman, it was largely a Greek population. And just again, some ideas of what they did back then. I think they're interesting to look at, but I really can't say an enormous amount. However, some of the gold work is really quite splendid. Uh, this is a pin. And uh, I'm not sure what you would use it for, perhaps in your hair to hold, you know, whatever down. I don't know. But uh, quite a nice piece. And again, probably not possible uh, uh, until they were able to actually uh, begin to pour the gold. And, and again, that, that type of thing comes in the Bronze Era, uh, where you can actually work molten metals. Uh, it simply didn't occur to anybody before that that I'm aware of. And, uh, you know, some simple type storage jars, but you can see they did, uh, this is your basic storage jar. I mean, it's not a high art item, but it is what they did. And they bothered to do little things like etch pictures of dogs on it. So anyway. Now, this is probably the important stuff uh, for this area. And that is the fact that you've got these figures. Now, these figures shape the way they are. When we get into the archaic, you'll see the progression. You'll notice the feet are both together. They're not split like we're gonna see in our cake that you saw in the video. They're very tight and the arms, instead of hanging straight down at the sides, are crossed over. Uh, it's almost, I, mean, I, I don't know what you'd call it exactly. It's almost as if you were scared to death and you, and you, you kind of huddled into a thing like that standing. Uh, it, it, I don't understand why they did it that way, but obviously that was what was done. And 
the fact that most everything you see from that era has that type of posture is important because obviously that is how you did it. Uh, you know, from an era like this, obviously we're not going to know the names of the artists, but I think you can basically say that once the style was developed, everybody did the same thing for the most part. And again, just some other quickies. I think what's interesting is some of these very, very early BC things are found on the Acropolis slopes. Now we need to talk about that just a little bit because we'll get to that a little bit more later. And that is frankly that they would take the old stuff, use it to build wider and wider walls around the rock that is the Acropolis. And this stuff would be used as fill. So they just kind of dumped the old stuff into the pit, so to speak, and on they went. And you'll see that later because we're gonna have some very, very interesting sculptures they pulled from the south wall, I believe, of the temple that preceded the Parthenon. And uh, you look at it and you say, my God, how could they pull that stuff down and just throw it into a junk pile, but apparently out with the old, in with the new. So again, just some ideas. Notice that the, the, the work on it is a little bit more delicate the handles and such. And then we get to uh, some of the stuff from Cisco. Cisco was a palace. Uh, obviously, at some point when they went to the Dark Ages, which is right past this, uh, fell into disrepair. And in the ground, they found some of these things. This is in the cemetery there. Uh, would, it would be some gold and some bronze. And some of the work was really quite stupendous. Uh, that's quite a uh, bullhead. And uh, one of this, one of the earliest excavations, 1876. Uh, anybody that knows anthropology or archaeology is familiar with uh, Schliemann. He was a he was an absolute top of the profession, and uh, like most of them back then, uh, self trained. <laughs> so. They didn't always do things the way we do them today. But at any rate, he did find this. And uh, I just want to show you on the map where it was. And it's somewhat between uh, Mycenae and Corinth. And uh, this is the pit out of which this is where the palace was that they found it in, or by the cemetery, by the palace. Right? Some other works. Now, this one always reminds me of the Wizard of Oz. I don't know why, but I, I tend to look at that lion and I think, ah, that's the lion, all right. This middle one, to a certain degree, resembles some of the stuff that you find in Peru that was Native American. And obviously the last one is obviously from this era. Some of the things they did with the gold, not that dissimilar to what the Incas did. They would literally make up these costumes, and you would wear this gold all over for whatever type of ceremony that it was used for. Uh, the work on it is, is quite intricate. And, and I, I think it's quite a, a testament to what they were able to produce. And again, we're looking at 16th to 15th century BC. So we're looking at 35, 3600 years ago. Uh, quite, quite remarkable. Uh, I think the picture was better in the video, but these are a couple daggers. But uh, what you do see is on the top one, you see that they're actually fighting or hunting rather, and they're hunting a uh, some sort of large cat-like being. And on the bottom, you've got some other ones there and some dogs. So. Uh, I think I got a little bit better pictures of this. And these are uh, some things, again, that would have been worn, uh, pendants or whatever. And uh, they're quite nice. I mean, these, these are these, I can see someone wearing these today. Yes. These were found down in Sparta, that, that region. Now, this is the large crater that he, uh, one of the large craters. Notice the figures of the people. Uh, it's almost bird like. Uh, it's just flat out, I, I don't know what they're trying to represent particularly. I mean, the horse I understand, the dog I understand, and the person still looks like a bird to me. But that's what they did, and that was the style of the uh, Terran's workshop 
and uh, a number of things we have uh, from that era and from that shop look like this. Uh, but I think the interesting thing is the actual decoration on the thing is, is quite nice. Um, and that, that would be from down here, which is uh, a little south of Sparta. This is the one that uh, he showed in the video. Uh, you'll notice certain similarities in the people, uh, the large noses, uh, the just the, the slight lip. The legs are a little bit better, but they're really not quite right. Uh, but I don't know that they, they worry that much about that. But an interesting form, it's a bunch of folks. This is the woman, uh, actually she's around there. Uh, wishing them well as they go off to war. Okay, the noses, common uh, postures, uh, all the same. And again, it's the same thing we saw in those figures where the legs in there, the arms are crossed, the legs are straight together. Once they decided a figure was done a certain way, there was little or no individuality to it. They all look about the same, which is not atypical of a lot of early things. Uh, the idea that everybody does their own thing is a relatively new one to culture. Uh, some female figurines. Uh, I'm not sure what they would have been, whether they were dolls for the kids or what, I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think they're interesting and they're, they're kind of fun to look at. Some jars, and again, I'm, I'm trying to move through this stuff. Now we get to the wall paintings, which are distinctly better. Uh, these are Mycenaean, which means uh, basically they're, they're in the area around uh, the mainland of Greece. And I, I think the depictions of the women in both of these are quite good, uh, particularly the one on the left. Uh, you really see quite a bit of her and you can kind of tell what she looked like. Uh, what's interesting to me is, and uh, you correct me anybody if you don't quite agree with me, but the posture of the face and the way the head is bent remind me of some of the early Chinese work that I've seen. Uh, very, very similar. And the thing to be remembered about this time in history, this is 13th century BC, which is approximately 3,300 years ago. There's little or no question that Asia, China, uh, India, in Europe, in Northern Africa, which was Egypt, had trade. They knew what each other were doing. So it's not particularly surprising that certain common characteristics seem to arise. Uh, we talked last week about linear A and linear B. Linear B, this is just what one of the tablets looks like. This has been translated. Linear A very recently has begun to be translated. This they can actually read. This is what existed prior to the uh, adoption of the uh, what we call, I guess, Arabic type script, which is what we use today for English. All right, now we get into the area that I think I want to talk a little bit more depth on today. And that is, first we'll start with the Dark Ages. Around 1100, the Mycenaean uh, culture broke down completely. Now the Mycenaean culture was you had a king, you had nobles underneath the king, and then you had the huge proletariat underneath that. And it was a very rigid social system. And whatever you were born is what you ended up. Uh, we don't know why it broke down. Either they were invaded or maybe the people rose up because in a, situ in a, in a, in a structure like that, there are often very few people at the top and loads of people on the bottom. And if they all get together and either leave or whatever, attack them, they can win uh, unless the military, in quotes, is able to put them down. If the military is composed of a lot of peasants, that may not happen. So at any rate, we get into an area where a time when all the cities except Athens cease to exist for, for all practical purposes. And uh, you wind up with people going back almost to a hunter gathering type uh, culture, uh, herding, harvesting whatever is where they are, but moving, moving, moving. Now out of this, interestingly enough, comes some really interesting uh, pottery, uh, which is what this period is, is pretty much known for. It's, uh, there's two types. We have this dark pottery, 
And then we have one that, that's, that looks like this area that I had the cursor over, which is a light pottery with dark markings. It's a geometric type uh, design. In fact, part of it will be called geometric. But at any rate, this dark age is somewhere between 1100 and 750 BC. So you've got uh, three or 400 years where everything is broken down. And now they have to build it up again. Uh, and I think what's interesting about this is it was during this period, because the structure of society broke down, that the thought of things like democracy began to circulate. People began to realize they could come together and organize whatever way they wanted to. And, and that changed the entire uh, future history of Greece. Uh, other things that happened at this point that I think are real interesting is you had the first Olympics in 776, and Homer wrote during this time, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the uh, first Troy. <laughs> we know about it because of what Homer wrote. So, I mean, and others, of course, but I mean, uh, this was a period that basically uh, spawned everything that came afterward. Now, I, I just mentioned this, there's two things I have at the bottom. One is I've seen as I look at history throughout the world that an awful lot of times periods of confusion actually result in great philosophies that then go forward because of the confusion. The Warring States period in China was an absolute disaster. Millions of people died. But out of that came Confucius, Mao Tse, Lao Tse, Sun Tzu, you know, the art of war, Lord Shang. And so the finest minds in Chinese history, the, the things that still push China forward today came because of this warring states period. Everything was in chaos and these folks sat down and thought and formulated the philosophies that brought them out of chaos. Same thing with the uh, enlightenment. Uh, you had all sorts of things occurring in Europe. Uh, and what do you get? You get Rousseau, Voltaire, Locke, Smith, Hume, Jefferson, Franklin, the Adams boys, and Hamilton in the United States. So out of a time when divine right was falling apart, you wind up with the, most of the philosophies that today uh, are used for our thought and our governance of the world. And the same thing could be said, I mean, if you wanted to push it a lot, in the Middle Ages, when uh, there were real problems, was what resulted in the Renaissance in Italy. So, yeah, bad times make for good thought, I suppose. All right, a few of these things. Now, these are called proto-geometric period, but it's for us, geometric is good enough. You can see they, it doesn't look like what came before. It's brand new. Uh, and what they've done is they, They've gone for shapes, and the shapes have a great deal of meaning to them. It's something that we still use today in art. In fact, I use it when I draw <laughs> to, a, to a large degree. Uh, the trick is making them pleasing together, and they do. Notice that they've taken the circular stuff and they've put triangles within it and, and, square, and uh, rectangles. So, I mean, it's very, very interesting. Uh, just another example, I just want to show you a few. And this is what I meant about the light stuff, which is almost the opposite of the other, but it's still very geometric. You'll notice, I mean, we, we run the gamut, the swastika, which, which obviously was a good thing uh, to them, it wasn't what we've come in the 20th century to associate with it, you know, Hitler and all of that. But, and as I say, uh, it's a very interesting shapes but they've managed to take loads of different shapes and somehow make them appealing together. And I think that's the thing that makes them art rather than just, you know, craft. Some of the things that they use to decorate these. And I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, the way the figures are lined up, again, uh, think Egypt, as far as, you know, this type of thing. But it's not real. It's not real surprising, as we'll see when we get the Parthenon. The friezes go around, and I mean, they tell one story all the way around the Parthenon. So that's not a real surprise. 
And uh, just so you can see, this is how big they were. This is something that's brand new too. The Neolithic and the bronze stuff, I mean, is small in size generally. Now, all of a sudden, we're creating uh, objects that are you know, six, seven feet, eight feet tall. You can hold an awful lot of something that big. That is a big, big uh, amphora. They obviously use them for a lot of reasons. Uh, I'm not sure you'd ship much in that amphora. I think maybe that'd be at home, but uh, I don't know. Again, just some other things. And now we, as we get to the end of that period, look what we're starting to introduce. We're starting to put, you know, some things that we recognize, some birds in, in the thing, in addition to the geometric shapes. So it's, it evolves. Again, this is strictly geometric, but it's a nice, nice example. Then we get to the figures. Now, these are pretty basic looking horses as compared to what you're gonna see in the archaic and the classic period, in the Hellenistic period, but it had to come from somewhere. And it's not to say that, you know, when you go back this far, 3,000 years almost, we don't know that we have the best examples. What we do know is we have examples. So here they are. And they're kind of interesting. Wizard of Oz again, the Tin Man, <laughs> as far as I can figure. It's a warrior figurine. Uh, it is a very, very interesting figure. Uh, and again, note the rigidity. Here we're kind of halfway between having our arms crossed and having our arms straight down. He's trying to make some effort to show that, but the legs are at the sleeves, you know, right straight on. And again, not a tight posture that a real person would have, but kind of interesting. Now we come to the period that I want to dwell on a little bit, and that is the archaic. This lasts about uh, 200 years. Uh, what you get here is this facial family resemblance. They all have this goofy little smile. They all have these, uh, I'll call them for one of something better, Egyptian eyes. Uh, and for the first time, sculpture now. We've, we've seen the ceramics get big. Now the actual sculptures get big. The sculptures we've seen till now were all tiny. I mean, you know, maybe a foot high at most. These things now, six and seven feet high, a lot of them, bigger than life size, okay? Uh, we begin to get temples. Once we get temples, we have to put something in the temples. And so what, we, what do we do? We create all sorts of sculptures, friezes, and carvings on the temple, temples, to fill them up so that they're not just bare, okay? Again, just a, you know, an idea of what the place looked like. Uh, this is a very typical design on a pot. Uh, everybody fought, they've organized into city states and they frankly, they fought each other constantly. Uh, the best we can figure. Uh, they traded a lot too. Uh, so an interesting thing. And we've got this contact with the rest of the world. So things are becoming a little more cosmopolitan. Uh, we've got, we're getting away from the dark ages and now we're actually establishing cities. And some of the cities are based on what we would consider semi-democracy. Some of them are militaristic like uh, Sparta, but they're all essentially what whoever the gentry are there want them to be. Uh, so at any rate. Just some nice things they produced. Now look how nice that is as compared to what we saw before. Uh, much, much better, uh, beautifully worked. It's bronze, it was found on the Acropolis, 6, 600 BC. So that's uh, about 26, 700 years ago. Again, note the smile. We're still doing things where if someone has come up with the way to do it, that's what everybody else does. We don't do individualistic work particularly. And again, uh, <laughs> the figure, I mean, 
I, I've seen some, some figures, particularly this one on the left in Southeast Asia that are very, very similar to this. Uh, some of the stuff in Assam and uh, into uh, Thailand, Burma, very similar to those figures. Did they know about them? Quite possibly. And then we get into some of the craters that they did. Now, uh, what I want you to see here is that they're very profusely illustrated. We've gotten away from the geometric and now we're actually portraying things that we want people to know about. For instance, Apollo, two female figures, uh, some maidens, and uh, they're welcomed by uh, his sister Artemis. We've got heroes on the neck of the thing. It's, it's a wholly different thing and would be very meaningful to someone who lived in that culture. To us, uh, they're just, you know, mythological figures for the most part. And I'm just gonna run through these reasonably quickly because we've got a lot to go through. But at any rate, here you have uh, some cups. Uh, very interesting how they've done them. I've rarely seen anything with the slits the way these have, but uh, they have them nevertheless. But what are they portraying? Lions, other kind of bears, different figures. Here you have uh, someone uh, fighting. And again, this was found on the Acropolis slopes, the end of the 16th century BC. So they, they literally took stuff like this and dumped it again into the walls when they didn't need it anymore. Trash heap. And then we obviously, our folks put them back together. Just, uh, you know, interesting view of a cat, people. So they're portraying stuff that is much more um, approachable to us than just the geometric designs. Uh, the emphasis now is on telling a story. Same thing, it's folks going off to war, uh, cat underneath here. Just, again, I just wanna go through and show you what the stuff looks like. Again, this is the archaic period, the period before the classical period. Again, some nice uh, examples of uh, the way they portrayed animals. Apparently animals were a great deal in their life. Some of which are real animals and some of which are imagined animals, of course. They mix them and that's not surprising. Again, I'll uh, move this through some of this stuff. See the little smiley faces? Everything from this period's got them. And we think we know who actually did this one. The swing painter. Again, same type of thing. Horses are getting pretty good now. They're doing better work. Uh, I mean, something like this, I think would probably be a special item to them back then too, as it would be to us. It's, it's, it's not just your thing that you put in the kitchen. Same type of thing. Now, uh, again, I just, you know, a little bit of individualism. I like the teeth on that, the lion or whatever it is. It's kind of neat. Uh, you have here a, a scene of a uh, woman sitting there. I would assume there's some knitting or something going on. I'm not certain. Then we get to things like this. Uh, these are Gorgon heads. Now, there's no such thing as a Gorgon, obviously. I mean, it's kind of like some of the things you see on the medieval churches. You know. Devils and little things like that. That's what that is. But what's interesting about this is this is the way we find most of them, but this is the way most of them were colored. Uh, this is what they actually looked like when they had them there. And the, the, one of the things that I think most of the folks don't realize, and we'll do it as we go through the statues, is most of these statues were highly painted. They weren't this, uh, you know, single color of marble that we see. They were painted. And then we get to some of the terracotta stuff that they did, which is really quite nice, uh, the deer. And uh, I think, you know, you get a bird, uh, probably, a, I would say a stylized sun, some birds, uh, I don't know. But at any rate, they, they did some very, very nice work. And this is a, a plate that you would use uh, you know, for food or whatever. 
and then some of these. So I think they did some very, very nice work. Now, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about what's where on a temple, because we're going to do this twice during this presentation, but I'll, I'll, because I'll repeat it so you remember it. Pediment is what goes underneath the roof line. Metopes, they go between architectural structures around and below the pediment generally. And then a frieze, will often run all the way around the building. It'll tell one continuous long story as it goes around the building. Now that, that's uh, particularized for the most part to the Parthenon, but it's generally the case. Now in scale, look at the size of these people and look at the size of the temple. I mean, just so you get a feel for it. These, some of these buildings were big. Now this is the, the Hecatompedos. The Hecatapodos is was where the Parthenon is today. These pieces were done in vivid colors. This is the pediment to it. And essentially, they were found in the southern part of the, of the wall to the Acropolis, the, you know, the mountain where the Parthenon and everything sits. They were found dumped in. They used them as fill when they pulled down the old temple to build the Parthenon, this is what it replaced. It's incredible when we think about it that they were able to find and reassemble this stuff. Uh, obviously, there were some writings from back then that's told about what was in this building, so they were able to do it. Uh, some really interesting stuff. Now you can see the coloration, but every all these figures would have been bright colors. You can see that there is. Still some of the paint left on them after all these years. And uh, it just amazes me that, uh, well, I think what happened was it, when you went from the archaic smiley face style to the classical style where everything was in the correct proportion, they looked at this stuff and said, oh my God, that's old. Let's get rid of it and we'll put new stuff up. So obviously this, this temple was leveled and they built the Parthenon where it stood. And again, I mean, it's very, very interesting stuff. And uh, here you have a lion that has taken down a horse. Okay, a bull. There we go. All right, there's another lion. And the horses. Now, the horses are a lot better than they were. Still a little stiff, but a lot better. Now, we're gonna look at some statues now real quick. And what I wanna compare, this is a Cora, it's a female. And notice the stiffness. Take a look at the statue of a king from the medieval, late Gothic work. You'll notice the posture's not that much different. Uh, it's almost like they hide an awful lot behind the, the stiffness. So at any rate, uh, it's very stylized. Then we get to this guy. Now, this is the typical smile. See his smile? All these figures have that same, shall I say, goofy smile? But they do. And uh, this is a particularly interesting work because uh, it's got him and the calf, which I think is very, very nice. Then we get sphinxes. Now you think, oh, sphinx, that's got to be for me. Nope. The Greeks had their own sphinxes. Again, notice the eyes, notice the smile. And on the next sphinx, guess what? Same thing. So there was definitely a style. Everybody had a smiley face and uh, those kind of interesting eyes that no one really has. But that was what they considered their ideal at that point. Did some nice work uh, on some animals. This dog, I think, is particularly nice. Uh, you got them from both sides. And uh, they did hunting with the dogs, obviously. And what I want to use this for is basically show this is a uh, youth. Look at the eyes. And I mean, there, there's an awful lot in common. Not quite but somewhat in common with the Egyptian stuff in the same period, uh, actually a little bit before. 
uh, but the Egyptians continued to do this. So I just happened to be the example I found. So what you've got essentially is uh, the way they model the eyes is very, very similar to what you see in Egypt. Now, some of the late Egyptian dynasties obviously were Greek. So it's not real surprising that there's a cross view. Another one, uh, just to give you some ideas of what they look like, very similar, isn't it? Then we get this one, it's a little bit different. And uh, don't ask me why it's different other than the proportions in the face are different. The other faces are a little longer. This one is a little bit compressed. And uh, frankly, to, to my eyes at least, much more pleasant to look at. So where is this leading? Well, as we make our progressions, again, look at the eyes, look at the eyes, look at the smile. To a degree, look at the smile, the Egyptian versus the, uh, the Greek. But uh, very, very pleasant. And then the statues themselves, stiff, very stiff at this point, 650 BC. We talked about painting. This is what it's, they, they indicate uh, this statue to the right would have looked like when it was in its temple. Now, which one looks better to you guys? I can tell you which one looks better to me. Uh, I, I like the one without the paint on it, unfortunately. And I think maybe that's our modern sensibilities that we come, we've come to expect that, perhaps. But again, some other ones just to get a quick feel. Again, I mean, it's a little much, don't you think? With all the color on it, I mean, a little over the top. Uh, but at any rate, that is what it looks like. Now the, the young men. Again, notice how the feet are kind of lurch-like. Remember lurch from was the Adams family? Uh, same type thing. Now this is a little bit better one, a little more relaxed, and it's a little bit later. Uh, this is called the Romping Rider, Ramping Rider, and he's on a horse and Thing to notice, he's still got the smile, doesn't he? Ah, yes. But he's beginning to look a little bit more real. Again, uh, just an idea. That's, that's what a javelin player would look like. That would be on, uh, if you were a famous javeliner and you died, that might go on your gravestone, which is what steel is. And again, a little more extension to the legs, not a great deal, but a little bit more, but the arms are still stiff as can be. Same thing here. And then we get to these. This is right before the end of the archaic. Now notice we're beginning to get a little bit of real movement, particularly, uh, well, all of these figures actually, but particularly the one at the top right, I mean, a real person would actually move somewhat like that. Here you actually have the hips canted at an angle rather than straight on, which is the way everything's been till now. So you actually got some movement. It plays against this. The tension is built by having that. It didn't exist before. Look at that. I mean, if you were good, that is how you'd, you'd move for the most part. Again, this we're back to a little bit stiffer. Now, this is the end of the archaic era. Now, what we begin to see here is we begin to see them actually portraying real people doing real things. And that's important because it's going to show up in the classical period. Also, these figures are much more lifelike. Look at, look at the way they're moving. The legs are separated. They're actually bent in a normal way. The next one on this, even more so. But they still have this goofy little smiles now because it's archaic. But the figures are beginning to resemble what a real person would look like. And again, you have something like this, which is completely different than most of the archaic stuff I've seen because his posture's totally off the wall. All right, on that happy thumbs up, we will take a five minute break and then we will uh, go on. Uh, 3, 2.30, we'll get back.
Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm here to ask. I have a question. Sure. You want me to ask it when we come back or now? You can ask it now or when we come back? Well, real quick, I've noted, noticed that on these uh, statutes, we see cornrows and twists on the heads of men. I uh, thought yes. that was from African culture. Very possibly because they obviously through Egypt would have had contact with Africa. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I, I think as time goes by, this is anthropological talk now. Okay. We're finding as we go back, that older cultures had an awful lot of interaction, much more than we suspected. That we're, we're, why we don't find it in a lot of cases is the fact that, if, for instance, if you go into Neolithic, there's no writing. Right. So unless someone kept a, you know, I, I, mean, I don't know how you would find out. What we've been able to do, for instance, is way back in China on the uh, paths that led from, you know, uh, Eastern Europe into China, uh, American and that type of thing, uh, they actually found skeletons of Caucasians and some of the stuff that they had that obviously had to have come from Europe. And the same thing happens as you begin to look at other cultures. As we do more and more excavations, we find things that shouldn't be there, in quotes, and they are. Hmm. And so it's no real surprise. I mean, look, I mean, Egypt, Egypt, as well as anybody can determine, there were, there were dynasties that were African in origin, mm -hmm. right? I mean, as there were dynasties that were Greek. <laughs> Egyptians were ruled by a lot of different people, many of whom were not Egyptian. And so they would have brought those things together. Mm. So no, it's no surprise that you're going to get uh, bits and pieces from all over and they, they co-mingle. Yeah. Does that I make saw, sense? Yeah, I, yeah. See, I saw a curly hair too, lots of curly hair. You're going to see all sorts of things, and that, that's kind of what makes it interesting. Uh, there are uh, definitely Greek statues uh, that, that show folks uh, that are of African descent, without a doubt. Uh, so yes, uh, it's, it's no real surprise. I think there was a lot more intermingling than most people are aware of. Uh, and that's, yeah, it's no real surprise. I mean, you're not talking, I mean, yes, they traveled slowly, they walked, but frankly, they traveled just as slowly in the Renaissance. Mm. And they all knew about each other. So, yeah, you know, forgive me for using Europe as my thing to time it out, but in all truth, I mean, we all, you know, you use what you're most familiar with it, and being that the, the Europeans wrote and, and kept records for a long, long time, it's easy to use them as a, just a common uh, thing to base other things on them. For instance, when the Europeans went to South America and encountered the Incas and the Mayans, those were highly developed cultures. Same thing when the Europeans later went into Africa. They were highly developed cultures. What was different was the stress of the cultures. The, effort, the, the stress of what the cultures considered important. The Europeans were technological and weapons. The African cultures, most of them, were into beauty, and they produced beautiful things. And, but in a lot of cases, they didn't work uh, stuff that lasted. They did beautiful stuff in hides. They did you know, a lot of good woodwork. But they didn't make big uh, structures like the pyramids or like the temples in, in, in Greece. And so. And, and the same thing uh, to a degree, uh, when, we, when we look at the Inca culture, we see these big buildings, but we don't even know what most of them were for. They were there, but they kept, we, you know, all the records were destroyed when uh, the Spanish came in and, and killed off the uh, folks who were the record keepers. That's the first thing they did. <laughs> uh, I don't know what they did particularly in Africa, but I will bet you that anybody that had any kind of knowledge of what went on got eliminated fast. That was the way the Europeans did things. Yeah. I mean, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's, it is what it is. Hey, Mark.
How is it so far? It's great. I just had to move so quick. Yeah. You're, you're working. You're working a good pace, Tom. I Does can, it feel okay? I can keep up. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Very Thank good. Thank you. Yeah, you know, you wonder because a lot of the stuff in the beginning, I knew I had to make it through very quickly because the stuff I want to emphasize is what the period that we're just finishing now and then the classical and the Hellenic, Hellenistic. And uh, I mean, they bear a little more attention because I think, frankly, they're more interesting and, and, and they, 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 they speak to us a little bit like this one that's on the screen right now. I mean, say what you will, that's really interesting. And I mean, it's just, I'm not sure exactly what. Yeah. He's supposedly in a race with heavy armor. I don't know. I mean, you got to be careful. Uh, my experience, uh, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong. Mark's a professional artist and a friend. I think a lot of artistic analysis is often uh, promulgated by people who want to be important, feel important, and they go into all sorts of gyrations, which may or may not have any basis in fact. Uh, I mean, the art business itself is kind of a strange one. Um, why is Andy Warhol famous when someone who was doing probably better work will never be heard of? Uh, who knows? I mean, so I, I, I take all of a grain of salt. But let's let's start off again. All right. So we're going to leave the. Uh, archaic period, going to the classical period. Now, this is what most of us look at and say, ah, Greek sculpture. And yes, it's terrific, but it's not the end all. And that's the point. I think that a lot of the sculptures we saw that were archaic were quite good. As we go into this, we get into an area where all sorts of interesting things occurred. And uh, essentially, this is the high point of Athens and Sparta, which defeated Athens. And eventually, being it was city-states, they were able to get carved up by the Macedonians, and then you went into the Hellenistic period. Uh, the ideal body for what's worth. Remember, I mean, they didn't have the, these folks didn't have the Victorian <laughs> worldview that we still have to a large degree where they viewed the you know, human body, something we view as something to be hidden. They, on the other hand, exalted it. I don't know whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, it just is. So at any rate, we begin to see the folks have much freer form. And the form looks really kind of normal. The faces, notice. Kind of ideal faces. They're, they're, I mean, this is a servant, and uh, he's not particularly thrilled, as you can see from his mouth. Uh, and you've got this big figure up here, and I mean, he's almost perfect. <laughs> I don't know any other way to put it, and that's what they were going for: perfection, just like Michelangelo, perfection. I don't, their version of perfection. At any rate. Some of the best stuff that we have has been preserved because bronze has sank at sea. Thank God they did, because uh, things such as this are just absolutely terrific. Notice the, the way the hips are canted, the way a hip would cant it in a real person. The, the right leg is back a bit, and up on the ball of the leg, the arm comes up in a way an arm really would. We don't have arms straight down at the sides anymore. And of course, we don't have the silly grin. Uh, the portrayal of the body is much more, to use the words here, harmonious and in proportion. It's, and to our eyes, obviously, used to photography, we look at something like that and say, God, that's good. And again, even on the vases, no more smiley faces. The people are in real good proportion to each other. Uh, it just, it's just easier for us to look at because it's more of what we think it ought to be. And they're kind of on the perfect side. And they're not all the same. This guy's got a hairdo, 
She's got a hairdo, he's got a helmet, she's got a hair. They're, they're not all the same. Each one is an individual. Start it off with the gods. Hey, excuse Maybe. me, Tom, there's a question in the chat. Are yeah, these the, classical pieces mainly marble? The, most of them are gonna be marble. Uh, some are gonna be sandstone. Uh, obviously ceramic, ceramic, right? The vase is ceramic. Does that answer? Who asked the question? Raise your hand so I can tell whether I answered. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and, and Rebecca, don't hesitate to just take your feet okay. off and ask your question. I don't mind. Uh, thank you. All right. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, again, uh, they don't look like the older version of the people. It's not as good a piece of work as the last one, which I think is much better. But. And then we get to these figures, and they're quite good. Uh, bronzes, again. Marble. Uh, this is a particularly nice piece because what it shows is you've got this cart driver with his cart, and he's coming up upon two gods, generally. If you show someone who's much bigger than the adult figure you have next to it, generally assume it's a god. I don't know which gods, but it is a god. Okay. And uh, as you say, it's beginning to look a little more real, isn't it? He is not done idealized. They are male or female. Okay. Then you get to something like this. Now, I don't know where his arms went, but it's this is a famous one, his torso. What's kind of interesting about it is look at the determination on that face. People say they're soulless. I don't think so. I, I, I tend to think that there was a lot to it. And the detail, the back, the butt, legs going down, is, is, is quite remarkable. It's, it's good, good work. And it's done without being over the top, which some of the stuff you'll see in a second is. Again, this again is a uh, votive relief that's essentially for all pra our practical purposes, a gravestone. And, uh, you know, he's kind of in the middle. There's certain aspects about him that verge on the classical, but not quite there yet. Hmm? Uh, a little bit toward the archaic too. This is earlier. And then we get somebody like this now. That type of figure, that Athena, I mean, it's just, it's just so interesting. Look how she's got her finger to her forehead, leaning on the pole, looking down at whatever's over here, her hands on her hip, her one leg is up and she's on, the, on her toes and the other leg is planted down. There's so much more to that than just what a stiff figure would be. And I think that's kind of what makes it interesting. You imagine what the body's doing underneath all the clothing. Zeus or Poseidon, we don't know which. Uh, I think you heard in the video they call him Poseidon. I think it, personally it's Poseidon, but that's neither here nor there. Could be Zeus hurling uh, thunder too, or lightning, whatever you want. You don't think you hurl thunder, do you? At any rate, uh, Big, big piece. See the size of the people? <laughs> He's a big, big piece. Another one that uh, came off uh, the ocean floor. We're lucky some of those ships went down. People at the time were probably miserable to lose something like this. But if they hadn't lost it, we wouldn't have it. This one definitely is Poseidon. And again, look at the detail. It's incredible work. Okay, Greek temples again. We talked about it. Why? Because we're going to go into the Parthenon. On the top of the pediment in the Parthenon would have been something like this. Now, the dark pieces are the ones we have. The light pieces are the ones that they have basically come up with. So I assume, I assume, that there must be some writing somewhere that described it by someone, and I'm sure there was. Uh, or they've actually come across plans. 
the reason I say that is because they're able to reconstruct the freeze all the way around the Parthenon. And believe me, most of it is plaster reconstruction. So they must know what it looked like, which is quite incredible. Just some things. I mean, anybody that's seen medieval churches will recognize this guy. Very similar. And I uh, show a uh, Norman gate in Windsor, England. And I mean, these guys are related. Of course, they're, you know, a little over a thousand years apart when they were created, but they're very, very similar, that, that type of thing. And, and they basically serve the same function. They're the end of a gutter and the water comes gushing out from the roof so it doesn't sit on the roof and cause everything to mold. This is what the West Pediment looked like according to what has been reconstructed. It's the battle between Athena and Poseidon to see who will be the city's patron in Athens. Obviously, Athena won, <laughs> for what it's worth, Athens. And on the other side, we have the birth of Athena, which is another reason to believe that Athena won. Uh, at any rate, you could see the number of figures that would have been on the pediment, top of the thing, big, big, big figures, some of them. Now, here's what they look like. Here's some of the horses. Now, the plaster horses are the ones that are reconstructed. The other the darker horses are the ones that are real. Give you an idea. I mean, this, this is a metal. This would have been between architectural members, and it would have been a whole bunch of scenes of things out of what we consider mythology, they consider their religion. And in this case, we have uh, centaur. Now, the thing that's so remarkable about the Parthenon and, and really most of the temples that you run across is they did, when they, they put these things up in a relatively quick time and did an enormous amount of carving on them. They must have had just bunches of supremely talented carvers to do this much this quick. It's just, it, I just find it incredible and they're all good. Uh, the friezes. Now, the friezes is interesting. We'll talk about that for a second. We're going to start off with mounted horsemen, and they carry different objects uh, to sacrifice to a female. Then you have a battle, prob probably the Battle of Marathon against the Persians. Then it goes on, and you have servants carrying things, finally slaves carrying things, and then you get back to gods at the end of it. It goes all the way around the Parthenon. Now, the Parthenon is a big building. And the thought that they could tell a story, you could walk around that building and, and learn all about that history is not wholly unlike what you see in your medieval cathedrals, where they have just laws, particularly the Norman cathedrals, where they have all of these pictures in a row from the Bible. And so you could be illiterate. You could look at those pictures and know most of what happened in the Old Testament in particular. Incredible stuff. So at any rate, here's the soldiers riding on the horses. Now understand, we're not looking at, we're looking at two pick, two guys on horses. Imagine three dozen of them. All as good as this. That's what's so incredible to me. Here's some more. Look at that. And you can see the white is where the arm was chipped off. What white, you know, so that, that's a piece of plaster. Here we have, you know, some, and it, it, it's, these are all done by uh, Phidias' workshop, which must have been huge. I mean, we talk about the Renaissance workshops, you know, 10, 15 artists, it must have been hundreds of sculptors, literally hundreds that do all this work. Now we get to the servants and they have the cows as we go around this frieze, all the way around the Parthenon we're going. Then we have the slaves carrying the, you know, their people, but their beasts of burden, essentially. Some more. Shepherds. And then at the end, what do we got? Some gods watching them. Because that's what gods did. They were up in Olympus, or where, where were they? Yeah, I'm on Olympus watching everybody do what they were doing. So you've got these big gods. With smaller, and here's a smaller people. So. Question. Yes. 
So in those sculpture pieces where you have men combined with horses, what influenced that? Real life. Uh, they, they had been using horses. Uh, they used them with chariots. They used them uh, to fight battles. Spearmen carry, you know, rode on horses. Uh, so it, it was just a uh, normal, normal going to battle type thing. And, and they fought continually. Mm. So portraying wars was to be expected. Uh, when you portray Marathon, you're portraying basically Greece beating the Persians. Mm. Uh, that was a big deal. It, it's like World War I or World War II to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. If you went inside the Parthenon, you would have seen this statue. And we were lucky. We actually have a one-seventh size version. I think one-seventh, something like that. Of what would have been in the Parthenon. That's what she looked like. Because it was a temple to Athena. We talked about the roofs. It was a temple to Athena. And that was what you would have found inside. Unfortunately, we have the copy. Uh, it's 12 times larger, excuse me. Uh, tw but, but it was found in 1880 in Athens. Uh, and that is what we believe the statue inside the Parthenon looked like. Athena. You know? yeah, I always thought that's interesting because you never know exactly. And obviously, there are traces of red and yellow paint. This would have been like red and yellow. And, and it would have been quite a, quite a spectacle if, the way they, they dressed all their uh, statues in paint. This is a uh, rather interesting <coughs> one. It's uh, another gravestone. And uh, it would have been a gravestone of someone, probably that one. And you have the gods around. Just, you know, some more horses and chariots. You see the chariot? Uh, and they would have been running into this guy. And I'm, I'm not sure what his significance is particularly. I mean, go into it, but I don't want to. Uh, it's got some gods, obviously. Now, this one's an interesting figure. This is a female figure with a boy. Now, I put it side by side with the Pieta by Michelangelo. And I've taken the Pieta and I've switched it around uh, because it, Pieta actually sits the other way. But what I wonder is how it is that Michelangelo essentially redid this figure. Now, was he aware that this figure existed or did he arrive at the same conclusion some other way? I have no idea. I don't think anybody does, but I do think it's very, very interesting how similar, uh, particularly the way Christ versus the boy lie on that. It is just, it, it's almost too similar. It's eerie how similar it is. And of course, we don't know how polished the surface was originally because it's been around for thousands of years. But at any rate, it's 2,500 years old. But I think it, it's a very interesting thing to look at. And I think essentially uh, they're very similar. Another uh, grave gravestone. This is a, obviously a kid died. It would be a servant probably. And uh, he played soccer, <laughs> their equivalent at the time. And he's doing the same thing. If you go over to uh, the soccer fields here in Tallahassee, you will see the kids doing with the ball on top of their knee dribbling. Just the same today as then. Uh, grooming a horse. Again, they, they, they like doing horses. Soldier. Uh, give you an idea of some of the helmets that they adopted. Shield. Again, look at his face. Tell me that there isn't pathos there, because I believe there is. Uh, it's definitely not soulless. And this strange thing, it's a pillar that they found in a cave that had these marble pieces inserted into it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to say other than the fact that it is what it is. It's just darn strange. 
We don't know exactly what the purpose was. Could have been some sort of cult. Who knows? You know, anthropology, when in doubt, say it's religious. Always seems to work. There's a uh, bronze statue of a youth. Again, look at the, again, luckily out of a shipwreck. Look at how, how well done that is. It's just incredible. Then we get to the Hellenistic period, which will be the last period we'll probably have time to do today. And that's the other great period. This is after uh, Philip and Alexander the Great invaded Greece and Greece broke up and was run by a bunch of little kingdoms and this and that. What changed was a common language developed. We already had the common writing, but the, it, it kind of came together to be just one language with big uh, urban centers. This is when Antioch from the Bible and Alexandria were founded. And uh, what you wind up with now is the classic stuff is that idealized body. I mean, those figures are what everyone would love to look like in quotes. I mean, these are different. These have a lot more emotion to them. Look at him, uh, the fellow on the right, the boxer. It's almost as if he's been beat to a pulp and he's learned something. I don't know what exactly, but he's world weary almost to me as I look at him. I look at his face. And we get some nice things now. We get these marble statuette of a little girl in which you play with a little bird. And it's just kind of cute. And we're doing things just because we look at it and we go, oh, gee, isn't that nice? Uh, what's happening at this time socially is you got a bunch of cults forming and, and philosophies, stoicism, skepticism, Epicureanism, that's good food and life, Neoplatonism, Platonism, but at any rate, a lot of mystery cults, a lot of things such as that. It's a totally different society than it was before the uh, Alexander the Great and Philip came in and, and took it over. Uh, the city states, most of them are somewhat allied. They have no choice, they're controlled. And it'll be that way till the Romans come in somewhere between. 200 and about 31 in BC and take the whole thing over again. The spirit of the Hellenistic sculpture has to be this marble group of Aphrodite, Pan and Eros. I compare it for, for what it's worth to Bernini's Apollo and Daphne. And I think there's an awful lot in common between those two sculptures. And not so much how they're carved, although that is somewhat evident that they're similar, but the, the nature of what they're doing. Here you have these two figures, Bernini, and they're kind of exalting things. Here you have a situation where she's being tempted. It's, it's very interesting, but it's, they're both emotional experiences. Notice he's got cloven feet, right? Uh, because it's, it's uh, well, it is what it is. But at any rate, they tended to show him with cloven feet because the, the uh, head of a, well, I don't want to go into, into that. But I mean, by and large, what you're dealing with is the fact that these are not real situations. These are just kind of these things that they have this emotional play on. And that's a vast difference from the classical where they showed the gods, but the gods were stately and they were pretty and they were beautiful and idealized. These are not, not at all. Again, uh, a little boy and his duck. <laughs> and I mean, the kid's contemplating the duck. Can't you just imagine a little kid standing by a duck? You know, kind of, hey, ducky, how are you? So I mean, it's, it's a whole different, mindset. S somewhat, it's early, this one's early, it's kind of between classical and Hellenistic. And then we have Alexander the Great. I thought you'd want to see what he looked like before they graffitied him. 
But that's apparently what the young man looked like. He wasn't very old when he died, so he probably did look like that till about the end. And of course, his helmet is a lion's head. We get theater masks now. And I mean, these very similar to what you see later in the Roman period. Uh, but look at the emotion there. Tell me there's not emotion on something like that. There is. Uh, it's not that. And that's the Hellenistic thing. This emotion. I, mean, it, I think it's, it, it's, it's fabulous. And in its own way, I think it's every bit as good as the classical. People can argue the archaic's not quite as good because it was leading to it. But this is what came after, and I think it was in its own, it can stand on its own two feet, so to speak. Richard Harris. Huh? Uh, fortunately, this one has the ivory eyes still in there. Most of them did. They would, you know, carve out of something, and this is bronze, and then they'd stick the ivory in. And I mean, frankly, he looks like a philosopher. Can't you just see the smarts exuding from every pore of that surface? I'm kidding. Looks like he also had a few too many drinks, but that's something else over there. Boy figure. And again, I another Bernini. This is one of his figures, and it's it, yeah, but the, the similarities are just, just astounding to me. But I guess if you're portraying the human figure and you have the same spirit, you're going to come up with the same kind of portrayal, I mean, complete with a little, you know, nose and everything. I mean, it's very similar, very similar. Uh, I'll go through a few of these quickly. The, uh, these are some big sculptures. Uh, I think they're very, very nice, but they, I don't think they lead me to want to make many comments about them particularly. Uh, this head of uh, Demeter is just huge. Simple as that. I mean, it is monstrous. So it's three feet high. Just the head. Can you imagine how big the statue was? Whew. Same type of thing here. This one is half a two, I mean, foot and a half high, this head. Hermes. You notice the hair designs are changing somewhat. Tragic mask. Now we have uh, Eros uh, sitting, and again, I, I want to show this basically because it's ceramic rather than a marble, and so it would have been in a niche somewhere in, in a temple. That's Eros. Famous story. Uh, Dionysus uh, sits on the shoulder of uh, Papa Selenos. Uh, that's, that's a famous thing in, in, in Greek mythology and be it what it may, it is what it is. These two guys. Now, we're beginning to change again a little bit. Let's see where this leads. Again, some shapes about what you'd expect. And I want to move through this rather quickly because this is the pride and joy of the museum. And this is the uh, big museum. This is a horse and young jockey. The jockey was African, Dolores. Okay, lest there be any question about it. They even identify him as being African, which, you know, suggests to me that there was pretty good intermingling. So let's look a little bit closer at this thing. Look at the work on it. It's a bronze. Again, it was pulled up because it sank at sea. Look at that horse. Look at that kid. The concentration on his face is just incredible. That kid is riding the wind. Incredible work. Hellenistic, not classical, Hellenistic. I think it's every bit as good as anything I've seen that's classical. And then we get to some other ones. Poseidon, now you'll notice the muscle structure's sagging a little bit now. He's an older guy, and so he's sagging a little. 
He doesn't have that, you know, 18 year old body. We're looking at someone with a, you know, 50 year old body. That's a difference. They don't need to make them look ideal. Fighting goal. That's an interesting piece. Uh, the, uh, you know, talk about something having absolute terrific uh, sense of urgency and movement. That figure has it. Yeah, I, I, of all the figures that they that, that we'll look at today, in terms of comp uh, compelling emotion, I don't think you're going to find one better. And when someone says, oh, that Greek stuff and that Roman stuff, they had no soul. I don't agree. There's an awful lot of soul there. Look at him. This is uh, Odysseus. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. It's obviously, it was under the water quite a while. One we looked at before. Statute binding is here. Athlete binding his hair. Now, this one's interesting because this one, I think the sculptor had the same problem Michelangelo had. And that is he had a block of, that couldn't be carved <laughs> quite right. Michelangelo used a thing behind the leg to support the body or the, it would have fallen over from what I gather. This is roughly the same type of thing. This is an architectural piece that will hold him up so that he doesn't tumble backwards. So at any rate, I always find it interesting, similar problems apparently solved in similar manners. Another uh, one of a child with his dog, I think kind of interesting. And you didn't see any classical uh, sculptures of, of babies, but you have one here, that's a toddler. And then finally, the head of a priest, uh, He's, he's beginning to get, you know, we're into the Roman almost, the look of him. And under the Romans, now I'm going to move. If you need to leave, leave right now, but I'm going to go. I've got another 10 slides or so just to show you the Roman work. I don't mean anybody have to stay, but I'll finish because I just, I don't like to leave it. All right. Western Roman Empire became a bit of a mess. From 217 to 284 AD, there were 20 different emperors. That's, that's, that's a lot of emperors in a very short time, okay? Things were in trouble. Eventually, the capital was moved to uh, Constantinople, Byzantium, uh, Istanbul, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is a, an, an emperor, uh, Lucius Verus. Now, I'm going to tell you something. His sculpture didn't like him. Look at his face. If you, I mean, this is a nasty guy. And you can just tell looking at it. Now we're going to go into some of the Roman families. Wait a second. There's a Hermes. Notice, again, the bulk muscles are gone for the most part. And we're, do, we're portraying them a little bit differently. I wanted to see this one because uh, it's Emperor Augustus. Uh, probably one of the most famous emperors. And realize in three periods, we've gone from archaic where everybody had a smiling face to classical where everybody looked like Charles Atlas, to Augustus here, I mean, through the Hellenic, to Augustus here, where he probably looked an awful lot like that. I mean, you look at him and you can see that's a real person. And then we get some of the other characters in the Augustus story, uh, Claudius, I Claudius, Caligula, that wonderful chap who Livia, so you can see what they look like. Livia is kind of soulless, I have to admit. And then uh, Agrippa, <laughs> another sweetie. So I mean, you see, they're, they're portraying them as they somewhat look. Again, as a statue of Nike. Now I'm going to move through this quickly. Head of a priest. Uh, he's rendered, frankly, I think a whole lot better than the uh, royalty. And then we have the sleeping mermaid. This thing is just, I mean, I, people could say that it degenerated in the Roman period, but that is a heck of a statue. And uh, it's a shame we don't have the whole thing, but that is extremely well done, extremely well done, beautiful. And the, I wish I had the picture from the other side where you could see how she's canting. I mean, 
it looks like someone literally laid down and put their hand over their, you know, uh, under their head. Beautifully done. Some of the other things, just real quick. You notice they're not quite, I don't think they're as good as a Hellenistic, but they're these, most of them, but they are what they are. That's kind of a nice one. Again, when you get the column to hold the figure so the figure can be a little bit of an angle. Armies. Another funeral, uh, gravestone. And we actually know who the person was on that, which is quite interesting. And you get the Roman period, you actually have records of all this stuff. Romans were great record keepers. We don't know who this was, but it was believed to be the minor ruler somewhere. Obviously, a pretty handsome guy. But a little bit sad. Don't you think? Look at the eyes. Again, you know, they say there's no soul. There is soul in the world. Uh, magic spheres. A lot of cults came up in this time, and so they they, they did these magic spheres, uh, which is a, is a sideline as well. Uh, figure of the Saturn. Again, this is a uh, piece of ceramic. Very nicely done. And finally, uh, part of a, a clay bowl. Uh, I don't know how you'd use a bowl that had all of that <laughs> incising on it, particularly. Uh, Maybe it was just a decorative piece. And that basically is it. And uh, I will now ask if anybody's got any pictures, I'd be happy, to, uh, questions rather, I'd be happy to answer. Hmm? Uh, I heard somebody. <laughs> I have a question, Tom. Yeah, sure. Um, the Dark Ages, did they start with the fall of Troy? No, that, I, I would say that that was, well, you know, it's really hard to tell. Uh, I don't think so, because I think what it more, more was, uh, the Dark Ages actually were, when the Mycenaean social structure, for whatever reason, was stressed to the point where it fell apart. Because what you have is you have an awful lot of abandoned palaces all over, you know, generally by the ocean, but I mean all over Greece from that period that all of a sudden were emptied out and everybody left. And obviously the towns or cities, whatever you call them, would have been around those things. I'm not sure that Troy up or down really mattered that much in the, in the greater scheme of things. Does oh. that make sense? Okay, thank you. You have several compliments on the class. Oh, well. Maybe. Thank you, and uh, that they learned a lot and things, so that's good. I have one question. Um, Go ahead, Rebecca. Tom, as, the, as you went through the periods, and as it seemed during the Hellenistic period, the figures were more detailed and um, sophisticated. And I'm just wondering, and then all of a sudden, during this shifting to the Roman period, it looked like something was lost. Was, was that due to um, the detail, some of the detail was, was that due to the artistic interpretation of the Romans or am I, let me, let me give you a couple of suppositions. And if somebody knows the answer better than I do on this, I'm going to tell you artistically, if someone told me I had to create things in a certain way, I'm not sure my heart would be in it to the same degree it was when I created things that I wanted to create in a way that made me happy. Yes. Uh, Romans were not easy rulers, particularly. I mean, a very violent society, the Roman society. If you didn't do what they wanted, they killed you very soon. I would suspect that has something to do with it. That said, we have Roman replicas of Greek stuff, which are just wonderful, but I have a sneaking suspicion the people who did it wanted to do it. Uh, that would be my guess. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But, uh, you know, 
styles change. I mean, that, that, that's really what we're looking at. We looked at about six or seven different styles. And we'll go from smiley face, or oh, real old stuff, but I mean, the smiley face to classic where everything looks, you know, idealized to emotive to under the Romans, it's more rigid, prescribed, what needs to mm -hmm. be done. Uh, they're not doing it, I'm not sure, for the same reason the Greeks did. The Greeks did it because it, particularly in the Hellenistic, because they could. I mean, they, they saw things and emotionally wanted to portray them individually. The Roman stuff seems to me always to be a little bit more confined in terms of style. Now, if somebody knows, Mark, do you, do you know an answer to this better than I do, per se, or not? But, uh, but that would be my supposition. I mean, I, but I don't know for certain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard because there are those who maintain the Roman style is just wonderful. Yeah. So I don't know what to tell you. I'm just giving you the stuff that was Greek made by the Greeks until, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mark? This was fabulous. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Tom, one of the, a couple of the Roman sculptures that you showed um, were poorly proportioned. Like yeah. the shin bone was way short compared to the thigh bone. Mm -hmm. And I just, do you, do you know anything about the training of the artist? Because there, so much of Greek culture was concerned with a focus on art and Roman culture was so much on military. Do you think that had something to do with the difference in skill? Well, uh, you know, it, it's interesting you mention that. If you take a look at uh, Great Britain, uh, They've got, they've, they, they, they excel in certain areas, in other areas they don't excel in at all. And, and particularly if you look at the area, British Empire area, 1830 to 1940, uh, not a lot of great art. Uh, it wasn't their big thing. Uh, a lot of good literature. Uh, and so it may well be that uh, Romans didn't place quite the same. You know, I want 12 statues for this temple. I need them by next Thursday type thing, as opposed to all these people pitching in as a civic duty and trying to create something wonderful. And I think maybe that, 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 that I, I don't see someone doing the same greater work for an occupying country that they do for themselves. And that would be my guess. And yeah, if the thing's not quite right, they're not gonna know the difference. So, I mean, you know, what are they going to do, send it back, so to speak? So, I mean, I, that, that, I kind of think that that probably is part of it, but I, I can't say for certain. I mean, getting, how do you get inside someone's head for 2,000 years ago? I, I don't know what you would do. Anybody else got something? Enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds funny, but I do think about this stuff. It's, it's interesting. You bring up the same things, the types of things that I thought about because you can't look at this stuff for four or five weeks putting a presentation together and not have it smack you in the head that, hey, something's missing now. Well, sure, and comparing it to our own culture and, and just, you know, how, what you were talking about before, how tough times makes great thinking, but also yeah. people times can make great art. And, yeah, I mean, look at the great art from the Renaissance. The reason that a lot of it was Italian was because of the fact that their nobility was willing to pay for it. <laughs> I mean, say what you will. Plus, they were digging up all the ancient sculptures all over Greece, Rome, you know, all that area. These people are looking at this stuff for the first time and saying, my God, how'd they ever do this? We, I mean, we thought we were the modern ones and here that what they've done is better than what we did. And that's what spawned your Bernini's and your Michelangelo's and your uh, yeah, Giotto's and all, all of them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, but, and again, they created the high points they tend to create when it's something that they're proud of doing and want to do. If somebody does something because they have to do it, which I think to a large degree, much of the Roman stuff was, I think they do because they, yeah, all right, we'll get it done <laughs> somehow. So, yeah.
Thank you so much, Tom. This was a really great class. And I know nice, um, you had a lot of compliments. I hope everyone is still on. Wonderful. Enjoy. Thank and you. Thank, thank you, Tom. You for participating. Excellent. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank That's you so really much. I did my best. Right. Wonderful. <laughs> I would not say it is, but I did my best. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. You Thank covered you. a lot in a short period of time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys.